morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here at High Hill Christian Church online campus. We're glad you're here. If you want to go ahead and get connected with us, go to our website at highhillchristianchurch.org slash church online. Fill out a connection card there and we'll be in touch with you. Go ahead, have a seat, get comfortable and enjoy the service. Hi, everyone. Welcome to High Hill Christian Church. Uh, if you're new with us on YouTube, uh, Facebook or our website. We are so glad that you were able to join us this morning. Our staff and elders are ready and available to fellowship with you and to pray with you. Right now, let's go ahead and get to a place where our focus can be attuned uh, solely towards God and everything that he is and everything that he has done for us as we enter into our time of worship today. Oh, 
Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Joel 2.12 Father, as we prepare to end 2020 and enter a new year, let us pause a moment and turn our hearts back to you. God, we don't want to have another year like this past year. We don't want another year of stagnation going through the motions. Help us commit today to start this next year seeking after you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, welcome to High Hill Christian Church. Welcome to those of you who are joining us here at the High Hill Campus. If you're joining us at the online campus, welcome to you. And welcome to you who are joining us at the Girls Town Campus. Today we're starting a new series called Holy Hunger. Uh, And since Christmas was only two days ago, probably not thinking about hunger. You're probably feeling maybe a little stuffed. I don't know about you, but I feel like with Christmas and Thanksgiving, it just, it feels like that season, like a giant buffet. Uh, For my family, over the course of this weekend, we'll have celebrated four Christmases, which means lots of presents and lots of food. But in this series, uh, we're going to be focusing on a different kind of food, a different kind of hunger, a different kind of appetite. We're going to be talking about spiritual food. 
and a holy hunger and an appetite for more of God. Now, I have a surprise for you. Uh, It's underneath your seat, so reach underneath and pull out uh, that envelope. And for those of you who are joining us at the Girlstown campus, just ask Papa Dave. Um, He's got something that I gave him to give to you. Now, you'll find in that envelope a chocolate chip cookie. Now, if you're joining us at um, at the online campus, I apologize. I couldn't really figure out how to put uh, the cookie through the internet. Um, So I tried to do the next best thing, and in the chat, I provided you a recipe for Grandma's chocolate chip cookies. Now, here's what I want you to do. Pull out uh, that cookie and just take a big old bite of it. Because uh, we are going to be talking about real food in this series um, because it sets up for and walks with us through a 21-day church fast. And that chocolate chip cookie, yeah, that's the last thing you're going to eat for the next 21 days. I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, You might already be thinking, in our 21 days, there is no way that I could possibly uh, go 21 days without eating. And I can assure you, it is possible, but that's not necessarily what we're asking you to do. Now, the Bible mentions uh, fasting 77 times. And for point of reference, uh, depending on which translation you use, the Bible only mentions hell 13 times. So fasting is talked about a fair amount in the Bible, but you'll find that it's rarely talked about corporately in the church. In fact, many Christians don't actually have a good idea of what fasting is. Now, when the Bible uh, speaks about fasting, it, it mainly speaks about it in the context of food, which means almost always when you're fasting, you're fasting from food. But the point of fasting is less about what you give up and more about what you take up. You see, you might give up uh, food for a set period of time, but you need to take up a habit, a habit of prayer. Or you might uh, give up social media, but you need to take up a heart of worship. Because fasting is giving up something or denying something and replacing it with time spent with God for a specific purpose. Now, the idea of fasting might seem um, overwhelming to you or scary or intimidating, uh, but again, it's less about what you give up and more about why you're fasting and the spiritual growth and benefit that you will get from it. And we are calling the whole church to a 21-day fast which is which is a very biblical thing to do because multiple times in the bible the nation of israel calls for a corporate fast and they cry out to god to loosen the bonds of wickedness and oppression in their lives and they set their hearts and their mind back on god and together as a church we're coming together to pray and fast at the beginning of the new year As we enter 2021, we are together praying and fasting for God to move in our lives and in the lives of our congregation like never before. Now, if you've never fasted before, uh, something you can try is to go three days uh, with just juice and liquid only and then convert over to the Daniel fast, which is no meat, uh, no bread, no sweets, and no dessert for the remainder of the 21 days. But there's a bunch of information in your fasting guide on the seats around you and and in the link in the comments. Um, Or you can go to highhillchristianchurch.org forward slash fast to find out more information about why to fast and what we're praying for as a church and um, all of those details um, there. Now fasting, it's, it's healthy and good for your body, but that is a side benefit. If you do it right, if you do it for God, then something incredible happens spiritually. It is possible for you to fast over the next 21 days and never gain anything spiritual because you are fasting for the wrong reasons. In Zechariah chapter 7, God says, why are you fasting? You aren't fasting for me. 
If you're fasting to draw closer to Jesus, if you're fasting for breakthrough in your life, if you're fasting for guidance and direction from the Holy Spirit in the coming year, if you're fasting from a place of repentance and humility, then I promise you, your life is going to be profoundly changed. Because when you sacrifice and make time for God during the fast, powerful things begin to happen. This fast is saying early in a new year, God, we are going to put you first. We're going to seek you for direction in our life. We're going to seek you. Today, we're going to be talking about how fasting is hungering for God, which sounds simple. And right now, hunger doesn't really mean anything to you. Um, But trust me, in a few days when you start the fast, it's going to mean a lot. There's going to be a point in the fast when you are so hungry that you could eat anything. Now, let me give you a couple things to expect when you fast. At some point, the fun is going to wear off. Yeah, we're fasting together, and you're going to hit a wall. Trust me, you're going to hit a wall where the hunger is so intense that you might feel like I cannot make it. I just have to eat something. And there's going to be this voice that says, what's the point? No one will know if you cheat a little bit. God isn't doing anything anyway. Because when you fast, not only does God take notice, but Satan does as well. And the enemy is out to destroy you. And when you fast, when your flesh is at its weakest, Satan is ready and waiting to attack. Jesus felt like that when he was fasting in the wilderness and praying for 40 days. And when you fast, you're going to experience emotional highs and emotional lows. There are going to be days when you feel great. You're on a mountaintop. I am so close to God. And then something happens and all hell is breaking loose around you and you hit a wall. And in that moment, the enemy is going to whisper to you. He's going to manipulate your emotions. He's going to bring up your past. And he will promise you the moon and back if you will just give up up. But remember, this is about seeking and praying and seeking after God, seeking direction and increase in your life. I've, I've been there. And I promise if you just press on, you will experience that breakthrough that you're praying for. But that is exactly what the enemy doesn't want to happen. Because fasting is hungering for God. Now, I'm not a doctor, and I don't really have any medical experience at all, but I do know that there's a hormone in your body that is called ghrelin. Can you say that with me? Ghrelin. Now, this hormone, ghrelin, is what makes your stomach growl. Like, have you ever been sitting there, and it's super quiet, and your stomach starts to growl and and rumble, and you look around nervously to see if anybody else heard it? Like when someone is praying and all of a sudden your stomach's like, feed me, Seymour! You don't have any control over it. That's Greenland. It's called the hunger hormone. And it causes your stomach to growl, but it also uh, causes this feeling of hunger in your body. Because we don't have to remember to be hungry Ghrelin roars every two to three hours and makes you aware it's time to eat. And if you'd only feed it some Oreos or some chips or a cheeseburger or some biscuit and gravy, then it'll stop. Only then will it calm down. And for the next 21 days, as we embark on this fast together, you're going to hear that Ghrelin a lot. But what if there was a spiritual Greeland. What if we were so connected to God through his word? What if we talked to God through prayer to a point where spiritually our body begins to growl and cry out because we are so hungry for more of Jesus? 
What if we built in our lives a habit of prayer and Bible study? What if we had such an expectation for God to work in us and through us that we actually began to experience hunger pains when we slacked off spiritually? In the coming days, uh, as you join us on this journey of fasting and praying, you're going to feel like God has done a miracle in your life, like he has made the sun stand still because you're going to look at your watch going, oh man, it must be bedtime, and it's only nine in the morning. Your days are going to stretch and feel like weeks, and in that moment, though, when you press on, the fast is working. In those moments, you will experience a taste of what Jesus did in the desert for 40 days. You'll experience what Jesus commanded us to do. Because he didn't say, if you fast, he said, when you fast. Because he wants us to experience seasons of fasting and prayer. And that understanding will be driven by your physical hunger and your newfound spiritual hunger, your holy hunger, as you replace your meals with times of prayer, as your, your snack time becomes worship time, and your morning meal becomes a time of Bible study. It's holy hunger that's going to push you to the place that God wants you to be in this next year. You see, this holy hunger, it's going to push us to a desperate place where we say, I cannot have another year like 2020. I'm tired of just going through the motions. I can't keep checking church off my list. I want to hunger for God. Holy Spirit, cause a stirring in our minds and hearts this year. Let us not be complacent. Let us not go through the motions anymore. Let us not make church a social club, but let us grow more desperate for you. Give us hunger pains for our family that we know is lost and going to hell. Give us hunger pains for our community that is so far from you. Give us hunger pains, God, for your church. Let us no longer be content. Let our spiritual life become more active than our snack life. How many times have you walked to the fridge and opened the door, not because of Greenland, but because of boredom? Or you stop for gas and you're like, oh, I need a Coke and a, and a Snickers. I pray that your spiritual life is so focused that you feel just as bad as you do when you skip a meal if you skip a time of prayer. That holy hunger pain rumbles inside of you when you skip church. So here's the question. What are you hungering for? Are you spiritually hungry for God? Are you willing to say, I don't want a year the same as this past year? I don't know about you but I don't want another 2020. I don't want to just sit here and go through the motions again, and I don't want to come to church and check the box and nothing changes in my life because I am hungry. And fasting is hungering for God. And all along our faith journey, nothing else can satisfy that hunger like God can. Today we're going to be in uh, the book of 2 Kings chapter 7. Now for some context, the book of First and 2 Kings that appears in our Bible as two books is actually written as one book and it tells a unified story that continues on from the books of Samuel. And uh, in Kings, David has unified the tribes of Israel into a kingdom, and God has promised that he would send a messianic king from the line of David, and that king would fulfill the promises that God had made to Abraham. So the books of First and Second King tells us the story of the line of kings that comes after David, who won't live up to the promise and actually run the nation of Israel into the ground. 
And eventually, Israel splits into two kingdoms, the northern and the southern kingdom. Uh, And the southern kingdom is called Judah. And they had a mix of good and bad kings. And this, the southern kingdom, was where the line of David was. Now, the northern kingdom was called Israel, and it had terrible kings. So God sends prophets to prevent the corruption of Israel, which is where we are in the story today. And today we're going to be talking specifically about one prophet named Elisha. Now the prophets of the Old Testament, uh, they're not fortune tellers who told the future as many um, might think they are. They actually spoke on behalf of God. They were the mouthpiece of God, like an alarm clock from God, and they called out idolatry and injustice, and they continually pointed the people back to God, back to the covenant that God had made with his people. The prophet called people to a place of repentance and challenged them to follow the Torah, which was God's law. Now, we're going to be in chapter 7, but I want to go back to chapter 6 for just a moment, because in chapter 6, the king of Aram is at war with Israel, which is the northern kingdom. And Elisha sends word to the king of Israel about where the Armenians were going to be, and this enrages the king of Aram, and so he sends men to try and capture the prophet Elisha, and they find out that Elisha is in Dothan, uh, which is a city, and the king of Aram sends an army to surround the city at night. And this, this is what's profound. In verse 16, uh, they wake up the next morning and they find themselves surrounded. And Elisha says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha asks God to strike them with blindness. And he prevents the king of Israel from killing them. And eventually they leave and they stop raiding Israel. Now, you would think that this act of kindness uh, to the Armenian army would get the king of Aram to leave Elisha alone, but it doesn't. So he decides, the king decides, he's going to go lay siege on the city of Samaria, which causes a famine. And it becomes such a crisis that all the food is gone, and they become so desperate that the things they said they would never eat, they're fighting over. For example... You could buy a donkey's head for 80 pieces of silver. Now, if you think that's bad, that they're eating donkey's heads, for five pieces of silver, you could buy a cup of dove's dung. That's right. They were so hungry, they were eating dove poop. And when you are hungry like that, you don't eat the right things. And you begin to consume things that you said you would never consume. And it's the same way with our spiritual life. If we're at a place of spiritual hunger and we don't feed on the right things like God's word and prayer and fasting, in those moments, we're going to be tempted to feed on things we said we would never consume. And when we try to satisfy that spiritual hunger with things on the internet... Our carnal desires, our soul becomes lean and empty. And spiritually, it becomes so long since we've experienced the Holy Spirit moving in our life because we're feeding on the wrong things. And your spirit begins to groan with holy hunger pains when we don't take time to feed that hunger for God. And we substitute it with things of the world, that junk food, that dove's dung and donkey head. We become empty spiritually. Maybe that's you. Maybe you feel empty spiritually today. And we try so desperately to fill that hunger that only God can satisfy with other things, we become like a shell. You see, because we know what it takes to look spiritual. We come to church, we drop some money in the plate, maybe we even serve a little, but spiritually inside we're anemic. We're just going through the motions. 
And we make all these excuses and we fill our life with all this stuff. But deep down in our soul, it's crying out for God. And we go to the lake or we go to the game because we think those things are going to satisfy us. But they never do. And in chapter 7 of 2 Kings, it says that there are four lepers outside of the city. And if you don't know anything about lepers, uh, they were outcast. You think it's bad to be in the city where people are buying and eating dove's dung and donkey head, but because of this disease, these, these men were, or these lepers were banished outside of the city, and spiritually speaking, these lepers were falling apart. They weren't even important enough to be on the inside. Maybe that's you. Maybe the enemy is saying to you, you're a nobody. You don't matter. Maybe you feel like the lepers in verse 3 where it says, Now there are four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate, and they said to each other, Why stay here until we die? If we say, We'll go into the city, the famine is there, and we will die. And if we stay here, we will, go, we will die. So let's go over to the enemy's camp and surrender. And here's the, here's the genius part here. If they spare us, we will live. And if they kill us, we will die. Genius. If we live, we live. If we die, we die. But sometimes it's the least likely people who are the most hungry people, the ones who are told you aren't pretty enough, you aren't talented enough, you aren't gifted enough. But if you're hungry, watch out. Because hunger for God can take you far further than talent ever could. And these lepers knew the only thing that would move them out of their comfort zone, out of our complacency, is a holy hunger. And fasting is hungering for God. And the Bible says there are four lepers, and and I can't imagine what they were thinking, but one of them stood up and said, I cannot have another year like this. We are dying. Why sit here and die? The hunger pain is what drove them, and I believe when we begin to hunger for God, he will begin to do incredible things in our lives. Fasting is hungering for God. And when we begin to hunger, we move out of our pit of despair. We move out of our circumstances. When we are hungering for God, we move out of self-pity and hopelessness. And that hunger is what moved those lepers into the enemy's camp. And the Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 6 that the famine was so bad they actually began eating their own children. Verse 28 says, This woman said to me, Give up your son so that we may eat him today, and tomorrow we'll eat my son. We don't know that kind of hunger. These people were desperate. And when people do not fill that spiritual hunger in their soul with spiritual things, when they consume donkey's head and dove's dung in an effort to save their marriage and hold their family together, When people think that the solution to addiction and despair is carnal things and not God, then they in their desperation begin to turn on each other and devour each other. When that spiritual hunger is not satisfied with a hungering for things of God, we begin to attack one another and the enemy begins to divide our families and divide us. And that's really just a cry of our soul for a hunger for God. Now at some point, those lepers, at some point, they had to turn that hungering pain for God and turn back to Him. Because when we fast and pray, when we seek God, our lives are changed. Our family is restored and our church is is healed. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. 
Think about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. What is it that brought him back to the father? What got him out of the pig pen? Was it the stench? Or was it the financial ruin? Or the loneliness he was feeling? No. Verse 17 says, When he came back to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father. It was hunger. Those hunger pains is what calls prodigal sons and daughters to turn back to God. Those hunger pains will wake you up in your addiction and will wake you up to your spiritual apathy. When we began to fast and pray for our sons and daughters who have walked away from God, when we began to fast and pray for the chains of addiction to be broken in our life, when we begin to fast and pray for our church, God uses that holy hunger to push us back on the path. And when nothing else works, Mark chapter 9, which we're going to be talking about next week, in verse 29 says, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. There are spiritual attacks. There are evil spirits that afflict us that can only be put down and silenced by fasting and prayer. There are people we work with and people we do life with, people who are sitting next to us on the couch every day, people in this room who are dying and going to hell. They're being spiritually attacked and the devil is winning. And so it's time for us to get down on our knees and begin to fast and pray and hunger for God again. Imagine what God will do when we come together to fast and pray. There are churches all over the country, all over the world, who are beginning 2021 with 21 days of fasting and prayer. And imagine what God is going to do in our lives, in our community, in our church, in our family, when we begin to finally satisfy those hunger pains with God. So we're going to get ready to respond to God's word. And my question for you is, what are you hungering for? Is it the things of this world or is it the things of God? Are you at a place where you're willing to say enough is enough, this year is going to be different. My life is going to be different. My family is going to be different because we are going to seek God this year. We aren't going through the motions anymore. Maybe maybe that's you. Or maybe you're the prodigal who has run from God and he is calling you back to him. Or maybe you're trapped in addiction. Or maybe your family is falling apart. Maybe you're lonely and you need a family, a community some friends to come around you and walk with you because God doesn't want you to be a homeless Christian. So maybe he's calling you to make us your family. Whatever it is, God is moving you to do something. He is calling you to respond. He's calling you out of fear and into his presence. So here's what I want you to do. There's a card on the seat around you. I want you to grab that card And I want you to write down what it is you're fasting and praying and seeking God for this year. If you're joining us online, I want you to type that in the comments. What are you praying for and seeking and fasting for this year? If you're at the Girlstown campus, I want you to grab a card. And here's what I want you to do. Once you write that down, I want you to come down to this altar and I want you to put it on one of these canvases. So we can begin to pray with you. 
And there's going to be people here at the High Hill campus who are uh, ready and willing to pray with you. Uh, There's going to be some men and women down here who want to be praying with you or for you. Or if you're not comfortable coming down, you can also go uh, back to the tech booth and you can put your card on that wall. But I want you as we stand and sing uh, to answer that hunger pain in your soul and satisfy it with God. God, we're desperate for you today. Awaken something in us. Awaken those hunger pains for you and our souls today. Let us crave your word like we do those donuts. God, give us times of prayer that break us. God, we're giving you a new year. We're chasing after you. I'm going to do something new for you this year, Lord, and I'm praying that you do something new in and through me this year. Holy Spirit, move in our church. May this year be a year where mighty things happen in our families. May this be a year where we move out of our comfort zone. May, may breakthrough come through the power of the Holy Spirit this year. God, break the chains of addiction in our lives. Break the chains of apathy in our lives. We turn back to you, God. We will not sit here until we die, Lord. Use us. We humble ourselves before you. Break us, Lord. Change us. May we seek your face over the next 21 days and come away changed. Carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now.
friend. So I run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father, fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon, my soul found a friend. So I run to the Father. everyone. If you're joining us online, go ahead and get your communion things ready. Here at the High Hill campus, our servers are passing the communion trays. Hold on to your cups and we'll share them together soon. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Luke 22:19. Jesus wants us to remember him and he uses food as a means to connect with him. 
The Lord's Supper is a celebration of Christ's victory over sin and death and over Satan and his allies. Engaging in this meal is a powerful testimony to the world that Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. How can eating a small piece of bread and drinking a little wine do that? Back in the Garden of Eden, an act of eating plunged the world into sin. One bite of disobedience led to death for Adam and Eve and for us. It caused conflict between Adam and Eve. It caused thorns and weeds to grow in the garden. It caused pain in childbirth. It led to sibling rivalry between their sons, Cain and Abel. All this came about through the act of eating and the rebellion against God that it represented. And behind the forbidden fruit was the whispering of the devil. As Pastor Tony Evans says, they got devilish consequences because they were eating at the devil's table. But sin and the devil do not have the last word. Jesus, the Son of God, who became human and gave up his own body and blood for our sake, has made new life and restoration possible for us. Eating at his table signifies our participation in what he accomplished on the cross on our behalf. He has fully paid for all our sin. We celebrate by eating the meal by which he calls us to remember him. The bread symbolizes Jesus' body that was broken for us. If you have your bread ready, take it with me. The juice or wine symbolizes Jesus' blood that was shed for us. If you have your juice ready, take it with me. Let's pray. Father, we honor you and your word. Thank you for reversing the curse of sin by inviting us to be one with you through the work of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Now is the time in our service we worship God giving this week's tithes and offering. So let's turn over to Malachi 3.10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebu rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. That is a lot to take in there. Basically, God says that when we bring in our tithe to his house, he will do three things. Number one, he will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a financial blessing in our lives to where there won't be room enough to receive it. Number two, he will rebuke the devourer for your sake, meaning he will protect you and your finances. Number three, is he will bless the land and the nations will call you blessed, meaning your church, your community, and your city. So when we tithe, God pours out a threefold blessing upon our lives, and all we have to do is receive it. As we press into God through 21 days of fasting and prayer, let's ask God to help us trust him more with our time and our finances. Many of you give online, and for that we are grateful. You can give online by visiting highhillchristianchurch.org slash give. You can also mail a check to 852 Boonslick Road, High Hill, Missouri, 63350. Let's pray. Lord God, today we bring the tithe into your house. And in your word you said you would pour out a threefold blessing upon our lives. We believe it and receive that blessing today. And we thank you for all you do through faith. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.
I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. You am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Yeah, you are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Yes, I am. this Sunday. If you have any questions or need anything from us, feel free to email us at info at highhillchristianchurch.org. Or if you want to get in contact with me, my email is joshw at highhillchristianchurch.org. We hope you have a great week and stay in touch.